Hello, everyone. Welcome to session three of our training series. This week, we will be exploring land cover classification. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be joined by Cindy Schmidt for today. And we are also thrilled to be joined today by Danny Fagan and Eric Clark from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. As we've discussed previously, this series will be provided via GoToWebinar on each Tuesday and Thursday of October, so from the 6th through the 29th. All the course materials can be found at the UTTC website shown here. Also, please refer to that website for guidance on the continuing education units. Also, that website is where you can find all of the lectures, course exercises, and all the data that you'll need. You should have downloaded all the materials for the exercise today to follow along with our demonstration. As we've discussed, this training series will be a mixture of lectures and hands-on exercises. We will be demonstrating all of the exercises in ArcGIS Pro, and some of them will have the options for desktop as well as QGIS, but those will not be demonstrated. And um, each week we are focusing on a different tribal region. So um, last week we focused on the Navajo Nation, and this week we are um, moving over to the, um, the Midwest. Here's a general overview of the training series. This week, as I mentioned, we'll focus on land cover classification and accuracy assessment. Next week, we will focus on change detection and time series. And in the final week, we will cover remote sensing web tools. For today's session, we will start with an overview of the process and applications of land cover classification and specifically focus on the methods, benefits, and limitations of an unsupervised classification. Then Cindy will demonstrate our unsupervised land cover classification exercise. And as I mentioned, please have the materials downloaded and ready for that exercise. But before we launch into the lecture today, we are so excited to be joined by Danny Fagan, the wildlife assessment biologist, and Eric Clark, lead wildlife biologist from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe, Chippewa Indians. They will be providing you with an overview of specific uses of remote sensing for their work and lands. So over to you, Danny and Eric. Bonjour, I am Eric Clark, the lead wildlife biologist for the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. I would like to thank you for your time and the good folks at NASA for the opportunity to introduce our community and some of the work that we've been doing over the last decade that leverages remotely sensed land cover data in our wildlife programs management and assessment activities. Before diving into Sioux Tribe's wildlife program, I'd like to talk about the community here and how our history connects to the contemporary wildlife management context that we work in today. Sioux Tribe community members are Anishinaabe, or the original people. Anishinaabe includes the people of the three fires, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi people. I'm speaking to you from Bawating, the place of the rapids where Lake Superior flows into the St. Mary's River on the current border of the United States and Canada. This map depicts Bawating, or Sault Ste. Marie, and the migration route where the Anishinaabe moved from the East Coast to the Great Lakes region, guided by prophecy. In 1974, six original bands from Sugar Island, Grand Island, Drummond Island, Garden River, Point Iroquois, and Sault Ste. Marie, who were all signatories to the 1836 Treaty at Washington, were collectively recognized as the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Today, the Sioux Tribe has the largest tribal population east of the Mississippi River with over 43,000 members who reside in all 50 states with populations centered in the ancestral homelands here in the Eastern Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower Peninsula of Michigan. 
In the Treaty of 1836 at Washington, the tribe ceded over 13 million acres and retained the rights and responsibilities to hunt, fish, and gather on those lands. These rights have been reaffirmed through the U.S. v. Michigan court case. The 2007 Inland Consent Decree provides the framework for intergovernmental wildlife management in the 1836 ceded territory. Our wildlife program is responsible for the implementation of this allocation agreement. Annually, Sioux Tribe issues over 150,000 harvest permits to over 4,500 hunters, gatherers, fishers, and trappers for off-reservation treaty harvest. We have wildlife harvest that occurs across the 1836 ceded territory, and we participate in the management of fish, wildlife, and plants on millions of acres of state and federal and tribal lands. Our mission is to protect and enhance treaty resources to provide for a subsistence lifestyle that is central to our community's culture. However, we have direct control over a relatively small land base. The vast majority of treaty-related harvest for Sioux Tribe occurs off-reservation. So much of our work is focused on understanding ecological systems in an effort to inform population and habitat management on tribal, state, and federal lands collectively. Specifically, we are focused on using Western and indigenous science and adaptive management frameworks to inform our collective decision-making process. So given all this contextual information, and that this training is focused on land cover data applications, let's talk about how land cover data is central to the work that we do here in the Sioux Tribe Wildlife Program, and why are we are focused not just on using land cover data, but also on the development of new land cover data products. To do this, I'll focus on, on two examples. First, I'd like to talk about how we've been developing better land cover data products to help us and our partners understand wildlife habitat interactions. And second, um, I'd like to focus on util how we utilize fine scale land cover data products to evaluate habitat restoration activities. So first, uh, let's, let's talk about wildlife habitat interactions. Much of our work on wildlife habitat interactions is focused on employing GPS technology to get very precise estimates of animal movement and how that relates to vegetation structure and composition. We've done this type of work with snowshoe hare, American marten, and we're currently working on a rough grouse assessment project. One major challenge is the precision of GPS technology that we have that we're able to employ in our GPS collars has quickly outpaced the development of publicly available land cover data products needed to evaluate those habitat relationships. This is a well-documented problem in ecology, namely that spatial scale mismatches will create biased estimates in ecological parameters that you're trying to study. So to illustrate this concept, we put together this, this uh, quick little diagram um, in this diagram, in the background, you can see individual data points collected from an American Martin fitted with a GPS collar. The multi-grid, the, the multicolored grid in the foreground depicts the pixels of a land cover data set. A resource utilization model estimates the importance of different land cover categories based on how much time an animal spends in each category. In this example, you can see there are very little variation between the amount of use between the categories because the the pixels depicted here are large relative to the to the spacing of our our data points from the gps collar conversely if we look at a, a different example you'll see that there's the exact same martin gps points in the background of this however because we've got data at a much or pixels at a much finer scale now you can see there's a lot of variation in the amount of use between each one of those categories. And then in some pixels, there's not any use at all. And so this is a very different picture that you get of Martin habitat use just based on changing that, that pixel size in the, in the underlying land cover data. 
So to address this issue, we have spent a lot of time undertaking land cover mapping projects um, that have resulted in a data set that has 10 meter pixels that's based on rapid eye multispectral imagery. Um, and this is compared to the, the best publicly available data set, which has a, a 30 meter pixel. So this is quite a bit finer in scale. Um, we are also continuing to, to move forward with this project. Um, we're developing a, a new data set for a smaller project area that will be an object-based land cover data set that uses LIDAR and worldview imagery. So I, I think the important thing is, is having this capacity to develop new land cover data sets and to employ specific data sets for different ecological problems is we can really tailor the classification scheme, which I think you'll be talking a lot about in this, this webinar to specific ecological questions that we're asking. To move on to how we use land cover data to evaluate habitat restoration activities, I want to talk really briefly about a Minoman restoration project in the St. Mary's River. It's hard to overstate the importance of Minoman or wild rice to the Anishinaabe communities. If you recall at the beginning of this talk, I displayed a map that depicted a migration that was guided by prophecy. And that prophecy stated that the Anishinaabe should travel west to where the food grows on the water and that food was Minoman. Because of this, we've been working on restoring Minoman beds in areas where it was historically supported and have been impacted by invasive cattails in the St. Mary's River. We've been focused on using mechanical treatment methods to preserve the native seedbed and to avoid using uh, chemicals in areas where, where people are potentially gonna be collecting or gathering wild rice in the future. Um, if you've ever worked in a coastal marsh environment, you know these can be very difficult um, areas to work in, often in you know chest deep water. Um, so one of the one of the tools that we've been employing in this project is using remotely sensed land cover data from small UAVs to evaluate the effectiveness of our various treatment prescriptions and to map new stands of Minoman. So to highlight the difference in, in scale between the previous project and this one, if you remember, I talked about um, that other classification project using imagery that had a 10 meter pixel size. These land cover data that we're collecting with our UAVs are a 3.5 centimeter pixel size. So a, a much finer scale and we're mapping much smaller areas with this. Land cover data has been vital to this effort in documenting our success in these coastal marsh systems. We have received funding to dramatically expand this work in the St. Mary's River. And in that work, we're gonna to continue to use UAVs to do pre and post treatment monitoring. So to summarize, you know, I would just like to say that you know, remote sensing based land cover data products are an extremely important tool in our toolbox here at the Sioux Tribe Wildlife Program. Land cover data is used in almost every facet of our program's work from, from developing project concepts to writing grant applications to doing sample design and site selection as well as data analysis. I think the, um, one important thing to think about is that building this land cover mapping capacity allows our pr program to produce more precise analyses and more robust information to inform our, our management decisions. And with that, given that we are a wildlife program, I figured I should leave you with a bunch of pictures of animals and say miigwech and thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Eric, for that fantastic overview. It's really great to see what has been going on um, in the Great Lakes region and the real world applications and uses of um, remote sensing imagery, uh, especially some of the drone imagery and how you are using that in your day to day work for um, wildlife management. So we really appreciate um, that presentation. So now we will move on to um, our topic for today, classification.
Remote sensing data is commonly used to assess land surfaces and the various land cover types. Image classification is the process of assigning all pixels in the image to particular classes or themes based on their reflectance properties. These categories could be things like water, forests, agriculture, urban areas, etc. The reason we classify images is to identify land surface categories on a large or regional scale. Once we've identified these different land cover categories, we can often do further analysis on specific land cover types, such as studying urban growth or deforestation. So we can take an image like the one on the right, where you can probably identify different land cover types and use the computer or your own knowledge of the region to classify the entire image into these categories. Here's an example of the National Land Cover Database that is a national land cover map created by the US Geological Survey. This is from 2016, and you can see they've identified these broad categories of land cover, like water, developed, deciduous forests, grasslands, and others. When we conduct a land cover classification, we are essentially turning spectral classes, or the reflectance values of each pixel, into informational classes. So for example, we know that vegetation reflects highly in the near-infrared wavelength, and water does not. So we can use the spectral signatures to create categories like vegetation and water. Here's an example of a satellite image on the left and the land cover map on the right from Panama. Generally, we take those groups of pixels that have similar spectral signatures or reflectance at, in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and we group them. Then we assign those groups of pixels to an informational class. There's not always an exact match between these spectral signatures and the classes. And that is why most classifications require some user knowledge of the region or ground information um, that can help with these uncertainties. When choosing a classification, classification scheme or the categories you want to group the pixels into, we should assign them based on land cover, not how the land is used. For example, we would categorize something as grasslands instead of ranching. You will also have a classification scheme with different categories and a legend that assigns a different color to each category. It's useful not to overdo it with the categories. So we don't want to create multiple categories where the spectral information would be similar for those categories. For example, a Landsat image has difficulty identifying specific plant species, but it can distinguish between vegetation and urban regions. There are many different ways to classify imagery, but almost all can be categorized into two approaches, pixel-based and object-based. In pixel-based approaches, each pixel is grouped into spectrally similar class, as this is the method that I've been discussing. These approaches are most useful where there are multiple changes in land use within a short period of time and are best suited when there is wall-to-wall -wall data coverage and time series consistency at the pixel level. Object-based approaches partitions an image into groups of pixels that are spectrally similar and spatially adjacent. Boundaries of pixel group delineate ground objects in much the same way a human analyst would do based on shape, tone, and texture. This process is called segmentation. These kinds of images can be easier for an analyst to interpret. This approach is also used um, more frequently on radar imagery to reduce speckle or noise in the image. It's especially useful for high spatial resolution imagery as well, because pixel-based approaches tend to be very noisy. The images below shows the visual differences between the two approaches. On the left is the pixel-based approach, and on the right, you can see the same image that has been segmented and classified. 
it produces a much smoother image, as you can see. When we use a pixel-based approach, we have a numeric value or a reflectance value for each layer or band of an image. Then we take that value and turn it into a classified image of multiple categories. So as I mentioned, this all relates back to the spectral signature. This is what we've discussed last week. Here you can see a typical vegetation signature in green, along with a soil moisture signature in red. You can see that the vegetation reflects highly in the near infrared, but it does not, um, but the soil does not reflect highly in the near infrared. So with this type of information, we can start to categorize the image. To take that a step further, we can look at the reflectance of three land cover types, water, vegetation, and soil, and how much they reflect in two different bands. So in this example, we can look at band three, which is the red band, and band four, which is the near infrared band. So here we can see that water has low reflectance in both of the bands. So it's located um, here on the, the bottom left portion of the graph. Soil reflects moderately in both bands three and four. So it's located near the center of the figure. Vegetation has low reflectance in band three, but high reflectance in band four. So it is grouped here um, on the far right side of the um, figure. So this is how the computer is essentially organizing these land cover categories. It's important to note, however, that there can be variation in the spectral signatures within a class. This image shows you multiple vegetation spectral signatures. While they have the same general pattern, the reflectance values are slightly different. The important thing here for land cover classification is to allow for a range of these reflectance values within each category so that we are including all of the pixels that are vegetation but we don't want to allow so much variability as to allow a water pixel to fall into this class, for example. So here's another example of taking the spectral signatures of these different land cover types and plotting them in order to group them into different categories. So here you can see the slight variation in the vegetation and soil signatures on the left, and then how they are plotted on the right. The computer will decide that although there is some variation within the class, these pixels should be grouped together as vegetation and soil. So to make all of this even more confusing, the reflectance values from each band are all being assessed at once. So we've shown you what a two-dimensional plot looks like when we are just comparing bands three and four such as the figure you can see on the left. But we have more bands than just two in our images. So we can create things like a three-dimensional plot where we are analyzing the reflectance values in three or more bands at all, all at the same time. So you um, can see these different groups or different classes in the figure here on the right. So when we group the pixels based on their reflectance values in different bands, we need to delineate the boundaries of each group of pixels. So we can categorize them based on their statistics, such as the minimum, maximum, mean, and standard deviation. These statistics can help us evaluate which pixels should be grouped together and which pixels should not be grouped together. While we will focus on the pixel-based classification throughout this training series, um, it's important to note that object-based classification is also very useful. So I mentioned this when we first started off today, um, but this not only takes that spectral information into account that we've been discussing, but identifies the spatial context of how those pixels are grouped together on a landscape. With object-based classification, patches of a single land cover are grouped together and treated as um, single objects. 
For example, large stands of forests are grouped together and then classified. So as I mentioned, again, this can help reduce noise or speckling where we see um, in this image on the left where we see these single pixels maybe um, being classified as, a, as something different than all of the pixels surrounding it. So that's the real benefit of the object-based classification, um, which we won't cover extensively here, but I wanted to make you aware of it. So now that we've briefly discussed what land cover classification is, we'll focus a little bit more today on unsupervised classification. So two different methods are typically used to create land cover maps, and we will have exercises on both of these. The supervised method can either use a pixel-based approach or an object-based approach, which we just reviewed. The unsupervised method always uses a pixel-based approach. In the unsupervised method, a classification algorithm assigns each pixel into one of the um, into a number of classes. Then the interpreters or the users assign each of those pixel groupings a value that corresponds to a specific land cover class. The supervised method utilizes user-defined areas of known land cover types, and these are called training areas. These areas are used to define the statistical parameters of the different classes within the algorithm. The algorithm then automatically identifies and labels all of the pixels that are statistically similar to those training classes. So we'll talk more about the supervised um, again um, during next session. So the process is a little bit different when we compare the unsupervised approach and the supervised approach. As I mentioned, for the supervised approach, um, this is often really useful when we know very little about an area. So we allow the computer to first group the pixels without any reference data. Then we evaluate how the computer grouped the pixels and we assign each of these groups or clusters to a set of categories or classes. Then we evaluate the classes and make edits to those groups as needed. Then we oftentimes rerun the algorithm and reevaluate the classification. For the supervised method, which we'll do on Thursday, we first have a set of ground truth data or training sites where we know what the land cover type is in that location on the ground. The computer then uses this information to group the pixels or objects into the same classes according to that information. Then we can evaluate the signatures, classify the image, and run an accuracy assessment on the image. For the unsupervised method, the objective is to group the pixels or spectral signatures of each pixel into clusters. As I mentioned, the advantage of this method is that you don't need to have a lot of knowledge about the region or any ground-based data. The disadvantage is that the algorithm is just using the spectral information from the image and may not categorize the pixels into classes that you specifically want. But oftentimes, it'll separate the classes based on slight variability within the class. So this requires you, as the user, to go back and evaluate those categories and reclassify. So here in our unsupervised classification, the computer does the first step here of separating pixels into clusters or groups. Then the user must take those clusters or groups and categorize them into classes that make sense. Like you can see here for water, conifer, or hardwood. So this step is regrouping or reclassifying the image into the classes that you want for your land cover map. So this we will go through um, during our exercise today. So you may need to combine multiple clusters or groups that the computer has identified as different classes, but may actually belong together in one class. Here you can see um, an example of an initial run of the classification. And here there are multiple water pixels that may just have slight differences in the spectral signatures 
but they still belong in one class. So you combine those classes or those clusters into one land cover class of interest. So this is the additional step you must take to ensure that the classes you've identified um, by the classes identified by the computer match the classes that you want in your land cover map. And we'll go through this today through the exercise. So that concludes our lecture portion for unsupervised classification today. We are now going to move into the demonstration of exercise four. And I did want to remind you all um, that on Thursday, we're going to continue this theme of classification, and we will be uh, conducting a supervised land cover classification as well as an accuracy assessment. Um, so do please join us on Thursday as well. So now we will transition over to the exercise, if you can bear with us as we um, move to that portion of the session. Okay, great. So now we're going to move on to our unsupervised uh, classification exercise in ArcGIS Pro. And um, we will be using a variety of data today and we'll talk through these different data. Um, and these are all uh, from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, um, very close to where our Sault Ste. Marie guest speakers are, are located and actually in their region. We will be looking at a Landsat image to run our unsupervised classification. And we will also be using some other um, data types such as Worldview 2 and the National Land Cover Database to really help us interpret our um, classified image. Um, and you can get more information about Worldview 2 and the bands and all of that sort of stuff in the exercise itself. But we'll talk through some of those as well. So let's just get started and create our um, new blank map. So we can come here and um, start a map. And we are going to call this exercise four. And as we've done with the other uh, hands-on exercises, just go ahead and save it to your folder um, where everything is located for you. For me here, I am um, going to look in our my NASA IP demo folder. You might just have a folder named NASA IP for all of this. And we're just going to save it to week two land cover and click OK. And the project will be created for you there. As with our other exercises, the world topographic map and the world hillshade will be automatically loaded. Um, sometimes I like to turn these off to increase the um, sort of computing power. Sometimes when those are turned on, it slows down your computer quite a bit. Um, and uh, Cindy and I's version of Pro might move a little slower as well. We can keep it in to sort of uh, make sure we're in the right location as, as needed um, for some context. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to add our data. So here you can come up to your view option and look at your catalog pane. And then you can look at your folders. And if you don't see your folder here in particular, you can add a folder connection. Sometimes this happens to me um, when uh, trying to identify my files. So now we should have our uh, week two land cover uh, folder here with all of our data associated with it. So this will be the same thing that you have downloaded from the website as well. So we are going to first add our Landsat image, which should be in our Landsat folder here if we just click on the arrow. And then we're going to add our Landsat clip and we can do this by right clicking and then add to current map. As we've done in other exercises, we're going to adjust the bands um, to 
to make the image look as we um, are interested in it. Um, in this example, we're going to use natural colors so we can compare it to our World View 2 imagery, which we'll add in a moment. Um, I did want to mention that now that we've added our Landsat image here, it's clipped to um, three primary counties in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Um, and then Sault Ste. Marie is right here. So um, just to orient you in space a little bit, um, we're very close to the Canadian border here in the upper peninsula of Michigan. If you zoom in and out, you can always come back to your uh, image by right clicking and go to zoom to layer. We are now going to adjust the color channels to uh, 432 for our natural color. Again, you can come in here and just do this by right clicking and selecting 4, 3, and 2. So this looks a little bit more like the natural landscape where we see vegetation is green. Now we are going to add our Worldview 2 image back here in our catalog pane. If we just click the down arrow next to Worldview, we can do the same thing here and right click and add to current map. And as you can see, the Worldview image is just this little strip of, of um, data here. And as you can um, see in the exercise document, Worldview 2 imagery um, has a much higher spatial resolution, onwards of 1.84 meters. And therefore, because of this really high spatial resolution, the data are very large. So if you're downloading Worldview 2 imagery, for example, um, it's going to take up a lot of space on your computer. So we, what we've done here is we've already clipped it um, and um, sort of to the region of interest. You also, when you download Worldview 2 imagery, you'll get these narrow um, strips of, um, of data here as well. And I did want to mention that the Worldview 2 imagery is, um, comes from a commercial satellite. So, um, you will have to pay for the, these imagery. Um, when we were first starting off and creating these trainings, we were working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and through their geospatial program, all of the um, federally recognized tribes had access to previously acquired Worldview 2 imagery. So that's how we were able to obtain this, this image here. Um, but just a heads up that if you're interested in Worldview imagery in the future, um, you may have to go through different channels or, or even pay for the data. So again, this kind of goes back to the trade-offs um, that we make um, and the decisions that we make in terms of the data that we use. Um, but anyway, our Worldview 2 imagery is here. Um, we also want to adjust this to the natural color. So we're going to um, do a similar thing here with the bands. However, um, for Worldview 2, the combination for natural color is 5, 3, 2. And again, you can see this information in your exercise about which, which band corresponds to um, which wavelength range. But we are going to use 5, 3, 2 as the red, green, and blue bands. So now that we've done it, you can see these colors look similar here on the map. The next thing we're going to add um, is the NLCD 2016 map, and we provided an example of what this looks like in the lecture. So same thing here in our catalog pane, we're just going to add this to the current map. So now you can see that um, this NLCD data is actually a classified map, so it might look similar to what we actually want to achieve in this exercise. Um, also, it has 12 categories, and um, each of those categories correspond to a particular land cover type. And in order to uh, characterize those as they have been done through the creation of this um, land cover map, we will import a color map that um, Makes it, to, makes it easier to interpret the map that, so that we can correspond them to the labels um, that we are interested in. 
And again, you can see what those labels are in your exercise. So what we are going to do here is we're going to um, just right click on the image and then go to symbology. And then we are going to click on these three dots up here and um, import a color map. And we can navigate to our folder here to find this color map. So we provided this color map in the documents, the data for today's exercise. So you can just click on that and click OK. So what this has done is um, changed, just change the colors to something that make a little bit more sense with our symbology. So what we are going to do, um, we can close the catalog pane and we can take a look um, very briefly at what this, this color scheme looks like here. And we can see the same color scheme here in our symbology uh, tab that we still have open. And what we're going to do is just change the label of each of these to match what is in your exercise. So you can see um, on the exercise document each of the um, values and labels. So we're just going to come in here and type in the following um, water. Developed. Barren land. Deciduous forest. Evergreen forest. And now you can see that these colors sort of correspond to what we imagine them being. Evergreen forest is a dark green. Mixed forest. And these are the um, designations that uh, were created by um, the, US, the USGS, who I believe is the um, entity that cre created these maps. Okay, um, shrub, scrub. Herbaceous. Pasture. Cultivated crops. Woody wetlands. And finally, emergent herbaceous wetlands. OK, fantastic. So now that you've added each of those in, you can see that the symbology in the contents panel changes along with what you've identified. So we can change that. We can close the symbology tab. And we want to, um, I am a huge fan of saving early and often. So take a, take a moment to save your project. Uh, you will thank me later when things crash, as they always do at some point or another. Now we're just going to reorder our images here in the contents panel so that the worldview image is on the top. So we can just click and drag these till you see the little line. The Landsat image is going to be second. So again, you just kind of drag until you see the line. It should stay. And then the um, NLCD map is on the bottom. So next, we will zoom into where our Worldview 2 image is located. You can just use the um, little scroll uh, option on your mouse to zoom into these regions. And as you zoom in a little closer, you start to notice some really clear features. Um, here is an airport. 
a small uh, little regional airport located in this area. You see um, some of the um, agri agriculture here and the forested regions. You'll also notice there's some clouds in the world due to imagery. Um, so if we were actually doing any analysis on this imagery, we might want to try to get rid of those clouds or mask them out. You also can very clearly notice the shadow on the cloud here. here. Um, one thing that we can do is if we're using the Worldview 2 imagery to sort of define what we see in the Landsat imagery is we can use a swipe option. And you can do this um, in the Appearance tab. And then by clicking on Swipe. And then you can, um, you'll see this little down uh, angle, this little triangle here. And what we can do is just hold it down and then we're swiping back and forth between um, two different images. So we're sort of swiping away the Landsat image in this example. That's one way to investigate um, your images. You can also just come over to the contents panel and just turn your images on and off. So you can see um, how things look with the Landsat image and then with the land cover map. So you can see pretty clearly that, hey, looks like a um, airport with the Worldview uh, 2 imagery. Pr pretty much looks the same with the Landsat and then it has been categorized as urban um, or developed in the um, land cover map. So you can use all three of these as you move through the exercise. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to classification. We are going to make sure our Landsat image is highlighted here, just as it's shown in blue in our contents um, window. So we are going to come up here along the top and click on imagery, and then our classification wizard. This will pop up on the right, and the classification method will be unsupervised. And this is a pixel-based classification as we've discussed throughout our lecture. And then for the classification schema, we are going to use the NLCD 2011 option, and we've provided this to you in your um, documents for this exercise. So we can just click here on the um, folder icon navigate to our week two land cover folder and select the NLCD 2011 revised. Click OK. For our output location, we just wanna make sure that we are located in our week two land cover folder. We can just click OK here. We're going to leave our reference data set blank and then click on next. Under classifier, we're going to keep this ISO cluster classifier selected. The maximum number of classes is going to be 20. The maximum number of iterations is also 20. The maximum number of cluster merges per iterations will be five. Maximum merge distance is 0.5. Minimum samples per cluster is 20. And then the skip factor is going to be one. Now we can click on run and let this process happen. Okay, great. So our unsupervised classified image has now been added to the map. This is actually a um, temporary file. So um, we are going to go through a couple more steps um, and we're actually not going to use this temporary file. But if we just come here to click on next, we need to save our classified data set. Um, so we are going to call this Landsat unsupervised. And because I've done this a few times in practice for the demonstration, I'm going to put a five at the end. Um, but you would just call this Landsat unsupervised. And then we will click on run. Great. 
Great. So now our Landsat unsupervised uh, image has been added. And we will go ahead and click on Next in our image classification wizard. And what we can do now is, um, now you can see a preview unsupervised assigned classes. Um, and so we have a lot in our contents panel. So let's just um, sort of collapse these by clicking on the arrow. And what we're really interested in is our preview unsupervised, our Worldview 2 imagery, our Landsat clip, and our um, NLCV 2016 maps that we'll be using. So we can just turn off these other two, but keep them in your contents panel. Um, but turn them off because we're not really interested in, in using them. Now over here in your image classification wizard, you can see that we have collapsed some of these categories from the NLCD data set. So we only have these categories, water, develop, forest, shrubland, herbaceous, planted, cultivated, and wetlands. So what we want to do here now is reassign these sort of arbitrary classes that were created by our unsupervised classification and categorize them into these categories that we have. Um, in our um, 2011 land cover map. The, the one that we like to start with is water because water is generally easiest um, to identify. And as you can see here, um, it looks like this dark maroon color has been identified um, in the water category. So what we can do here is just come and zoom into um, Lake Superior and we can really see that this is the water category in this first one with maroon. We can also turn on and off these layers so that we could see, for example, the Landsat and the Worldview imagery underneath and um, make sure that that is actually the water category. So now what we can do in our image classification wizard is if we come in here and click on the water category, you'll see that this gray circle has popped up, an assigned circle. So if we click on that, and then we come over to our map, you can see the little crosshairs. And if we click on this class zero, we now see that the new class has been identified as water. So this is associated with our um, category here. And if we expand this here and look, we can see that the class name has actually been uh, recategorized as water. An important thing to note is that you still need to keep these two layers in your panel, just collapse them. Because if not, this new class feature might not work. And I ran into that problem um, initially. So don't remove these, keep them in your panel, just minimize and turn them off. So now what we're going to do is we have 19 more of these old classes to essentially reclassify into these categories. And you can do this in a variety of ways. Um, and it really, it just depends on how familiar you may be with the area um, and the technique that you like to use best. But it's sort of a tedious process. Um, but we'll go through some of these and reassign um, these categories into the, the categories that we want. So just south of this water area located here, um, you can start to see this, this agricultural region. And we can identify these as planted or cultivated pixels. So what we can do here is just zoom into the agricultural region. And you can zoom in and out and kind of turn on and off these layers. You can also turn on and off the worldview to imagery 
And you can see that um, a lot of these regions here, these little squares, are the planted or cultivated classes. So we can do the same thing here that we've done before. Is we can come in to say our planted or cultivated and make sure we turn this on. And it looks like this category here, this orangish category is a planted cultivated category. So if we look down at our um, classes, our old classes, that was initially class 11, and now it has been changed to planted cultivated. So we can continue to go through this process and do this for each of our categories. It also appears that um, this sort of category four um, also looks like it might be part of our agriculture uh, category. So what we can again do here is turn on and off the different layers. You can use the swipe function to really get a sense of what's going on here. But it looks like this sort of purplish, there's a lot of purple maroon in my um, color scheme. Yours might be a little different. But this sort of purplish color scheme also looks like planted or cultivated. So again, we can click on that. And you can see that this has been reclassified. Again, you can always zoom in and out of your map to start to see what we're um, looking at here as we start to change all of our classes. Um, also, the other area, um, the other class for me that I've investigated, we can kind of take a look and zoom into this region as well. But it looks like class 18 is also part of this planted cultivated class. Again, if we turn this off and we can look at the worldview too, as well as the Landsat imagery and zoom in a little closer here, we can see that this um, teal color is also agriculture. So we'll do the same thing here. Again, just click on this area since we have the planted cultivated selected. So the next class we will assign is um, forests. And again, you know, you may not catch all of the planted cultivated at once. That's okay. Um, you can kind of zoom in and out and go through these regions and take your time with it. Um, we'll do a little bit of a shortcut here where um, I won't be you know, going through every single class with you because it can take quite a bit of time. Um, but again, just continue to work through your classes, check the old class and new class box um, for how you are redoing these. I'll go through one more for the, the one more example for the forest um, and developed but um, I won't be going through all of them in sort of the demo while we, while we um, stay together here, um, but do just continue to check your different um, land cover classes and colors and really try to identify these different features here. Um, so let's come in and identify forest. And um, we can do that by maybe first zooming into this worldview two image here because again, the world view two image, because it's high spatial resolution, it will really be able to define forest. So here you can see this forested region here, this dark green sort of color probably looks like forest. So we're gonna select forest here, click on this dark green color and just reclassify this to our forest color category. Similarly with the black category, we can do the same thing with forest and so on and so forth until you've um, changed all of your old classes to the new classes, the categories here from our revised. One last um, thing I will show you is the urban category, the urban areas. Um, you can identify um, sort of here in Sault Ste. Marie. Also um, the airport is a great place to look at the urban category. And here, if you come in and um, modify or click, continue to click on and off with these categories, 
you can see um, that that really dark green, these two very dark green colors are probably both um, urban. So we can turn these on and off and again, click on our developed category, come in here and reassign those pixels to developed. Same thing with these other green ones nearby. Okay, so continue to do that throughout your um, map. And um, I will do the same and we'll cut to sort of, um, so continue to do that with your, your map. Um, and you can see the example provided um, on the uh, exercise document of these different classes, but continue to do the same with yours. Go through the remainder of the exercise and your map should start to look like something similar to the map um, identified in the exercise um, document as well. So you can see here um, that I'm just going through and continuing this process with all of these categories. Um, and I've um, sort of stopped talking through exactly the process that I'm doing here, but you can see now I'm moving on to um, some of these different classes. And again, just doing the same thing, zooming in and out, comparing the different uh, maps and really trying to evaluate these classes. So um, this can take a little bit of time and you probably are going to be much more systematic about it than um, we are doing during this demo. But this is essentially the process that we're continuing to go through and um, mapping all of these classes. So um, if you don't hear audio for a bit, um, that's what we're doing and we're just displaying um, sort of what this process looks like and allowing you all to, to do the same as you um, follow along with the demo.
I also, okay. So as as so I so once you've gone through and meticulously reassigned all of your classes, in your image classification window, you should see now that all of your twenty classes are, have been categorized into the categories that we wanted um, from our two thousand eleven um, map. And also here in the contents panel, you can see that the class name has been changed to all of our defined classes that we want. Even though we went through this quickly and I cut out some of my uh, um, process, it's really important to closely evaluate your classes that you selected. Um, you might wanna go back in and make some changes and that's okay. Um, and your map might look a little different than the one that you see here, depending on the decisions that you made. Um, so it's really all about um, how much time you want to spend um, doing this analysis, how familiar you are with the area, and um, what you want your output to really look like. So you can always come in and, and change these decisions along the way. Um, so the final piece for this exercise is to save your uh, map. Um, always do save your project. We'll go ahead and do that. And then um, for the within the classification wizard, you will need to click on next. So now within the image classification wizard, we have this reclassifier option where we can make some changes if we'd like. Um, in this example, we're just going to scroll down to the bottom here and name our final classified data set as Landsat underscore unsupervised underscore merge. And then we're just going to click on run. Now you will see that the um, unsupervised merge TIFF was added to your map. And you can really go in here and uh, investigate your image now. Um, so you can come into areas and maybe take a look at places that you may have um, some confusion in your uh, classified map, which is um, completely possible. Um, as you were, we were just running an unsupervised classification. So again, you can come in here and um, collapse these different layers and start to look at uh, perhaps where there might be some confusion. So um, here's a great example, actually, in my map. Um, you can see that this uh, gray category is actually developed. Um, however, it looks like the um, there's some confusion here because this actually looks like bare ground. Um, and this is a common uh, occurrence in um, confusion in your map. So you can come in here and take a look at these different things. Also, I have some confusion with wetlands. I don't think there are any wetlands right in the center of my map here. I could be wrong. Um, but this really identifies uh, sort of the benefits and the limitations of using an unsupervised classification. Um, generally, you, an unsupervised method is really great for identifying the spectral characteristics of a map, of, of a, an area, excuse me, and um, noting these potential sources of confusion. Um, and really, when we do a classification, what's most useful is to run a supervised classification where we actually have ground data that can help the computer um, identify spectrally what those categories really are. Um, so you'll see the benefits of having um, training data when we do the supervised classification example. Um, but unsupervised is a great first step um, in really identifying um, the, the different land cover types, potential sources of confusion, and can be a great starting point for further uh, classification and analysis. Another type of uh, uh, classification is object 
uh, oriented classification. So one thing that you might also notice in your unsupervised um, image or layer here is that we have a lot of speckling happening. Um, there's a lot of noise um, throughout the image and that may or may not be true to what's going on on the ground. But the way that object-oriented classification works is um, it identifies not only the spectral uh, variation into different classes, but it also looks in space and identifies uh, spatially uh, adjacent regions and homogeneous regions and uses this spatial information as well to classify the image. And that's not something we'll cover in this uh, training series, but it is something useful to note um, about the way in which we run our classifications. So again, um, that will uh, be it for this exercise today on unsupervised classification. Um, be sure to join us next uh, session on Thursday for the supervised classification as well as accuracy assessment. So you could see um, that perhaps maybe my map isn't very accurate. So we're going to show how we evaluate the accuracy of our maps um, during the next session as well. So we will now pause and um, take some questions from you all. All right, everyone. So um, we ended a little early today, which is always a good thing and give you back some time I mean, in your life. Um, so there haven't been too many questions. I actually um, added a question of my own because <laughs> I thought you might be asking yourself this question. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and go through these first couple of ones. Um, the first question is about the slides for the Sault Ste. Marie presentation. Yes, we will definitely make those slides available. Um, and I, in the Q&A document um, that Amber is showing right now, I, I listed a whole bunch of different um, resources for reading about the different kinds of algorithms used for classification. And really, I mean, to summarize it, it just depends. Each algorithm clusters um, the pixels differently. So it uses different approaches for clustering pixels. And sometimes, you know, each one has its, of course, its advantages and disadvantages. Um, ISO cluster, the one that we use, tends to be used most often for unsupervised classification. Um, but there's other ones out there um, available, and you can kind of read about them in these documents. And, and also, um, Esri, Esri actually has some really good documents on the different kind of algorithms that they um, offer as well. So what we tend to do um, is just honestly is just experiment with the different algorithms. So you might try um, ISO cluster and then um, I'm not even sure if the Esri software has k-means is another one that's used quite a bit. Um, you can try the different ones and just look at the results, honestly, and that's the best way to assess the difference between the algorithms. Which one do you prefer and, and do you like better? Um, and so Marie is also asking, which one do you think is better? I don't know if there is a better one. Um, Really, I mean, like I say, ISO cluster and maximum likelihood are the most common used for unsupervised um, and then for supervised actually and there's more coming out all the time. Um, <laughs> so um, it, it's kind of your it's kind of like looking at the Landsat bands, you know, when you look at the different colors of the Landsat bands in, in a way it's kind of your own preference. Um, and the results that you get depending on you know what you're looking for. So as you can see, I'm kind of dodging that question a bit. <laughs> um, okay, so question three is actually my question that I thought you may have in your mind. Um, why do you have so many classes for unsupervised classification? So if if you're only interested in six classes total or even 12 classes total, why do you have to cluster 20 classes? Um, and the reason is because it's a lot easier 
to combine clusters than it is to sort of break them apart. Because as you can see, when you go through this process, you're gonna run into a lot of different confusion between classes. classes. And the more classes you have, um, it, depending on the class, um, you, you try to uh, reduce the amount of confusion that you're going to um, run across when you do a, a classification algorithm. Um, and so if you do more classes, that sort of minimizes that confusion that you might get. And like I say, it's always easier to combine classes if they're, you know, if two clusters are the same class, it's easy to combine them. It's much harder to break them apart. You can break them apart. There are ways to do that, but it's um, it's more challenging to do so. So typically when we do an unsupervised classification, we will do many more classes than than necessary exactly for that reason um, and one other thing having said that um, today we showed you unsupervised classification on thursday we're going to show you a supervised classification and honestly if you're going to do a pixel-based classification the supervised is the preferred classification methodology um, and that's because, and you'll see why when you go through it, it's, it, you have a little bit more control over, um, over your classes. And so basically you're telling the computer um, that you want the algorithm to discriminate between, you know, these different classes that you're specifying. Whereas the unsupervised classification, you're kind of leaving it up to the computer to discriminate between the, the spectral classes, just based on, on spectral information. So um, the unsupervised, I like to personally use to really look at the spectral variability in your image. So sometimes what I'll do is, is even though I'm gonna do a supervised, I'll run an unsupervised quickly and just assess where, I'm, where I think I'm seeing confusion. Um, and so Amber Gary gave a great example of that. Um, urban always causes confusion because it's so, there's so many sort of different um, spectral characteristics of an urban area. So it tends to get confused with other areas pretty easily. And so if urban is really important to you, then you may want to think about that when you do your supervised, are there ways that you can really pull out that urban um, spectral information separately from the areas that you might get confused with. Um, and there's some different, there's a lot of different kind of methods you can, you can do that. Um, you can use, you know, elevation, um, you could get some other kinds of um, vector layers that you can include in there and so forth. Um, so um, I really like to use unsupervised as a way to really get a feel for your data. So that's a long answer to that question, I realize, but I did want to um, clarify this a bit. As you go through the process of identifying those classes, it can be quite painful, as you'll see, but um, it's a good exercise to go through. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Again, um, both Amber and I will be available during, you know, during the week um, to answer questions via email. If you, um, if you go through the exercise sort of outside of this time period and you run across some issues, um, then please feel free to email us. Um, and hopefully, um, hopefully you don't run into any software issues. <laughs> which is stuff that we can't really deal with. We can't really answer those questions super well, but. And also just a reminder for those of you using QGIS, um, we do have those exercises available to you as well. Okay, so maybe if there aren't any more burning questions, um, Ben just asked, will the Q&As be included in the course? 
Um, yes, I believe, and maybe Amber, you can answer exactly if there's going to be a link or if we can use it, if we can include it in the zip file. It's a it's a Google document, so um, so we'll probably just uh, provide you with the link to to the document to the Q and A document. Hi all, if you can see my screen now, I'm showing the course website and we have included the link to the Q&A document as a PDF for the first week. We will do the same for the oh, rest of the weeks. <clears throat> so it'll perfect. just be a link here on the website as a PDF. Right, and just as a final reminder for those of you who want to get CEUs um, for this, please remember to submit your um, paperwork by the end of this week. So we'll remind you again on, on Thursday. And then of course, if you're not interested in the CEUs, but you'd like a certificate, um, if you complete all the homework, then at the, you know, by the end of November, which is the due date, then we'll, um, we'll be able to send you a certificate of completion.